Now we come to the meh theorem of the polynomial theorems, and that's Descartes' rule of signs. And I call it a meh theorem primarily because graphing calculators have totally rendered this useless. Um, and sometimes it's like super helpful, and sometimes it's not really that helpful at all. So first off, I have to define something, and what I have to define is a variation of sign, because Descartes' rule of signs is dependent on this concept. And a variation of sign is whenever two adjacent terms have opposite signs. And so if I look at this uh, expression right here, x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth, so on and so forth, I'm looking for variations in the sign. So I go from positive to negative there, that's one variation. And then from negative positive there, that's a second variation. And then from positive to negative there, this gives me three variations in sign. And so what Descartes noticed was a pattern in the number and type of roots uh, dependent on the variations in sign, which is a really cool thing back in the day, uh, but not so useful for us right now. Okay, so here's what actual uh, Descartes' rule of sign says, and here's the criteria. It says, let P of X be a simplified polynomial function with real coefficients. The terms are arranged in decreasing degree. Okay, and so once you have all that set up, then you have two portions of the theorem. The first portion says that the number of positive real roots of P of X equals zero is the number of variation of sign of P of X or, or, this is why it's annoying, is fewer than this by an even integer. Okay, and the second part of the theorem talks about negative real roots. It says the number of negative real roots of P of X equals zero is the number of variation of sign of P of negative X or is fewer than this by an even integer. And so Let's look at an example of when Descartes' rule of signs works really well. And the example I'm going to use is x to the 6th minus 15x minus 1. If I look at this, part 1 of Descartes' rule of signs says count how many variations of sign you have in the original polynomial, and I'd have 1. So I have 1 variation, which means that I have 1 positive real root. Because remember the theorem says it's this number of variation of sign or an even number of integers lower than this and since one it, I can only have one I can't have negative one positive real root so I, I know that there's one real root for this. Okay now part two says I have to find the variation of sign of the opposite of x and so what I do is I replace x with its opposite and I simplify the signs here and I look at the variation of sign in this case, of which I have one, which means I have one negative real root, okay? So by the fundamental theorem of algebra, I know this thing has six roots, right? And I know that one is positive real, and then I have one that is negative real. That means the other four have to be imaginary because I've been given uh, six roots in total, one positive real, one negative real, four imaginary. So now let's look at this meh version of Descartes' rule of sign um, because uh, you'll see why in a second. So if I have this polynomial, it's pretty long. There are five terms and then there are two variations of sign, right? So two variation means that there are either two positive real roots or decreased by an even number. So that means there can also be zero positive real roots here. If I look at the negative version of this polynomial, I have negative x raised to the seventh plus negative x raised to the sixth minus eight x negative x raised to the fourth plus three times negative x plus nine. And I just simplify this for signs. I get negative x to the seventh plus x to the sixth um, minus eight x to the fourth minus three x plus nine. And I look for variations in the sign of which I have three. So that means I have three negative real roots 
or one negative real roots. And by the fundamental theorem of algebra, I know that there have to be seven roots in total, right? And so if I look at the, the possibilities, I actually have to put them in a table. So when I ask you to determine, use Descartes' rule of sign to determine um, the nature, the possible nature of the roots, I want you to make a table like this, where you have positive real in one column, negative real in another column, and then imaginary in the third column. You can't use the word complex because they're all complex, but uh, imaginary. And so I can have two positive real roots, and I can have three negative roots, um, which means um, I have two left over for the imaginary. Or I can have two real roots, one negative root, which leaves me with four for the imaginary column. Or I can have zero positive real roots, three negative real roots, which leaves me with four in the imaginary column. Or I have zero positive real, one negative real, which leaves me with six in the imaginary. So one of these is true. If you remember back when we talked about the factor theorem, I said, oh, hey, I wonder if there's a theorem that will give me potential factors to try to synthetically divide out. And that theorem is the rational root theorem. And it's kind of a long theorem, and uh, it comes from, well, the fact that when you multiply polynomials out, uh, your roots are components of the leading coefficient and the constant term. So here's what it actually says. P of x equals 0 is a polynomial equation with integral or integer coefficients. Suppose that it has the root h over k, where h and k are relatively prime integers. Then h must be a factor of the constant term at the end, and k must be a factor of the coefficient of the highest degree term or the leading coefficient. And so what this does is it gives me a potential list of rational roots to try uh, to synthetically divide out. So let's look at a basic example to see how this works. So let's say, for example, I have 6x cubed plus 8x squared minus 7x minus 3 equals 0. Okay, so I take the constant term, and that's the h, right, which would be my numerator, and I look at all of the possible factors of 3. So I can have a plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 3. And then my denominators, which is the k, which comes from the highest degree term, which in this case is, is, is 6. So my denominator is going to be made up of maybe a plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, or plus or minus 6. So what the rational root theorem says is that if there exists a rational root, meaning fraction, integer, something nice, a nice root that I can synthetically divide out really sweetly, it's going to be a one of these ratios, plus or minus 1 over 1, plus or minus 1 over 2, plus or minus 1 over 3, plus or minus 1 over 6, which is from numerator to all these denominators. Or it can be plus or minus 3 over 1, plus or minus 3 over 2, plus or minus 3 over 3, and plus or minus 3 over 6. Now I can cross this one off because it's just 1, and I can cross this one off because it's just a half. So this gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 possible rational roots. So if there is a rational root for that polynomial, it's going to be one of these, well, 12, because they're plus or minus. Now, this seems like it's not at all useful, but it actually is, because you can do synthetic division to test all of these out pretty quickly. And as soon as you find one, you can create a quadratic, which you, th you can then solve like any other quadratic. So this is all the rational root theorem tells me. And so it doesn't seem like a super powerful thing. It seems kind of annoying. But in conjunction with the conjugate root theorem and the factor theorem and the remainder theorem and Descartes' rule of sign and the fundamental theorem of algebra, you can put all of these theorems together to solve something that's a higher degree. And so that's what you're going to be working on in class. Um, I'm going to show you how to put all of the theorems together, or I'm actually going to make you put all of the theorems together to solve something that has a degree higher than 2.